Hi everyone, John here with Fountain Pen Love, and today I want to talk about vintage inks. Now, I've been a collector of vintage fountain pen inks for quite a while now and have a pretty decent collection. Uh, this is not the entirety of my collection by any means. Uh, today I want to just go over Parker inks, and you'll see a lot of these are Quink, which is their main brand. It's still made today. But there's a few earlier ones and few variations that I also want to show you today. So uh, consider this a really informal and brief history and education in Parker Fountain Pen Ink from uh, pretty much before 1960. So what I want to start with is the oldest Parker ink that I have, and that is this uh, Parker Duofold ink. Now this is not Quink. This was made before Quink existed. And this was uh, pretty much made to be marketed with Parker Duofold fountain pens. They also had a Parker, just Parker ink. I don't have a bottle of that, unfortunately. But um, these are pretty much the earliest Parker inks that were made. Um, the dual fold ink was made throughout the 1920s until Quink started uh, being produced, but this was one of the only Parker inks that you could get. Uh, they started making Parker ink, I think, in 1917. So it goes back quite a ways. There are definitely older inks out there. Uh, Waterman specifically was making ink before Parker was, but Parker um, definitely has a pretty good history lots of collectible inks here. So once we get into Quink ink, um, you'll start to see uh, this particular box and bottle is one of the earlier Quink bottle designs and box designs. Now, um, one thing I do want to note, anytime I love the boxes and anytime I open one, I have a trick. I use a popsicle stick, you could use a letter opener, something like that as well, to slide underneath here. And then I kind of just twist. And what that does, a lot of times there's little tabs here that hook into these inside flaps. Um, this old cardboard is pretty fragile. And so if you just stick your finger under there and pull, a lot of times it will tear, which I think is really tragic. I don't like that to happen. So I use something thin like this to kind of pop it out. Um, and it works really well. I don't know if I've torn any boxes since I've started doing that. But this particular bottle, is from the early 1930s. This is some of the first uh, quink that was actually produced. And you can see uh, it's a nice squat bottle, has a cork cap on it, um, kind of worse for wear, but it's cork, it says Parker Quink on top. And then the box itself um, is fairly attractive. It's a nice looking box. This actually matches up with this particular um, bottle, um, not exactly year for year, but this rounded shape was carried through in the large and the small bottles. So um, this kind of teardrop shaped bottle is definitely some of the older Quink that's out there. So if you see something like that, you'll know it's from the 1930s. Um, similarly, we have this bottle here. Now this one is older, still from the 30s, but older than this one is. Um, and you can see the bottle has some little feet on it. It's changed just a little bit has a screw top cap instead of a cork. So this is from the late 1930s and much more closely aligns with this bottle here, even though they're both really, um, you know, from the same general era as far as Quink is concerned. Um, I also have this cute little bottle here. This was made as a sample bottle that was given out to people who could, uh, who wanted to try out the ink. And you can see it's actually really similar to this one here. Um, both in shape, not in size, but they have a lot of similarities to them. So uh, this one's a lot harder to find, much more collectible, um, but still just an ink bottle. Now, one thing I do want to point out, you'll notice on both of these bottles, they have um, kind of what's been referred to as like a wheat stock on them. And that's this little shape here. And you'll see it on this one. It's also right here. So that basically is something that existed during a certain era. This particular bottle is from 1938, 1939. Um, they switched over from these, um, you know, this shape of bottle to this more modern shape, which I have in a box here and I'll show you in a second. And with that switch came this teardrop shape 
of uh, larger bottles, even though this wheat stock was still on here. So this is from the early 1940s. And um, from there on, pretty much the 40s uh, up until the 50s, we have a very classic shape of quink bottle, which many of you will probably recognize. Um, I love it. I think it's very iconic. Um, I personally refer to it as like an art deco shape, but um, it's this more uh, squared off edges. It's still round, um, but it's kind of got a square shape to it. And if you compare it to this bottle here, you can see a lot of the similarities carried through. We have these um, ridges going down the top, but um, this one kind of carries them all the way down like table legs almost leaving some blank spaces where they put the label on this particular bot bottle here. Um, again, from this point out, they're all screw tops. Um, this is a metal one. They did make plastic ones as well. Interchangeable as far as I can tell. I don't think there was one or the other that was um, used at any given time period. But um, basically, these two bottles go together. Uh, both are from the 1940s and all of the quart or the larger bottles, 16 or 32 ounce bottles from the 40s were this teardrop shape instead of this more uh, cylindrical shape. So as far as box design goes, um, this is, as I mentioned, one of the older boxes that I have here. And you can see it looks a lot different uh, compared to say this one. Now there is kind of a bridge design and that is this box here. So you can see there are some similarities between this box and this one in the way they look. And I'll hold them up here so you can see them. Especially when you compare to this one, you can see, um, you know, you probably wouldn't mistake them for the same box. And this really is a bridge design. So it has a bottle inside that looks like this one here but the box is starting to look more like this one here. And this is from 1939 to 1941. Uh, you'll find boxes that look like this, which is really this transition period between this uh, cylindrical bottle and this tear-shaped bottle. So uh, if you see one that looks like this, uh, you can really put it in a very small time period, 39 to 41. Um, after that, Pretty much everything in the 1940s looks uh, like a variation on this. So this classic blue box, most of them have this band around the bottom. Some have white on the bottom, on the very bottom, some don't. But uh, again, inside the box or the bottle is going to look the same regardless of what color of ink or when it was made in the 40s. You have this classic shape here. And um, what I want to point out is this is a four ounce box and bottle. Uh, when you compare it to, well, like one of these two ounce, this is still a two ounce, even though it's older, uh, you can see it's significantly bigger. So um, not really any difference in the box design between two and four ounce, but you will see that uh, it's just physically larger. Um, during World War II, there was this microfilm black, and this was only made for a very short amount of time. Uh, I think 41 to 45 or so, really pretty much during the war. And um, these are unique. You can see the boxes still look the same. They're just different colors. So this is very much uh, red, white, and blue, uh, very patriotic, and it stands out that it's a different ink than this one. You can also see around the top, um, you know, it says microfilm black on it. It's, um, uh, let's see, where does it say on here? Actually, I'm not sure if this one does, but um, I guess it's on the back of this larger bottle where it says um, for reproduction purposes. So this was used, if you don't know what the um, microfilm is, basically people would write letters. Those letters were photographed, scanned onto little pieces of film, which were much cheaper and easier to ship overseas to troops. And then they could go ahead and enlarge them and read the letter. So instead of shipping paper, they would ship these little rolls of film, which saved time, saved weight, saved space, which were all super important during the war. Now on these boxes and bottles, uh, specifically for microfilm black, they look exactly the same. The label is the same, um, at least on these two and four ounce. But if uh, you look on the front, it says microfilm black instead of permanent black or washable black. So the box was different, 
but the bottle was very similar. Now I do want to show you on this larger box here, and you see sometimes the lid comes off. A little tragic, but that's what happens. Um, and that was like that before, I didn't just do that. Um, this is a large, this is 32 ounce bottle. Again, the uh, label on this one is different. Uh, it's red, white, and blue as well. Um, if you were to look at just a normal one, this one's older, but if you had a more modern uh, teardrop, you know, 32 ounce bottle, it would just be a solid blue label instead of this more patriotic looking one. So um, one thing I don't know, if you know, these larger bottles that came in 16 and 32 ounce sizes were made, um, you know, at the time, if you wanted to use a pen, a fountain pen was pretty much your only option. So for banks, for schools, for any place, uh, large uh, offices that had a lot of people writing, a lot of people using fountain pens, they would have inkwells or maybe smaller bottles that were then refilled from these large ones. So I, as an individual, wouldn't necessarily go buy 32 ounces of ink, but my office might. And that way we would have a big supply that we could keep refilling from. So when you see these large bottles like this, uh, they're not really made anymore. I think um, Sailor might still make their blue black in a large, um, I don't know how big, but a large bottle. But for the most part, we're buying small two ounce bottles of ink or 50 milliliters or whatever, not 16 or 32 ounces at a time. So um, these are kind of indicative of the era when Fountain pens were the main pens that were used, and in being so, a lot of ink was required to keep them flowing. Now, also in the 1940s, Parker introduced one of its most iconic pens ever, the Parker 51. To go along with that pen, they also created a new ink called Parker 51 ink. The idea behind this ink was it was faster drying um, so that it would flow out of the pen, almost dry instantly on paper. I think it says on here somewhere, dries almost instantly, completely permanent. Also very dangerous. Uh, this is known to destroy the insides of pins because of what was in the ink to make it dry faster. It um, did bad things to fountain pens. So if you ever see this, it's a great collectible, but highly recommended you do not use it in a fountain pen. Um, that was made throughout the 1940s until uh, I think 1948 or so. Uh, they switched from Parker 51 ink and changed to Super Chrome. And this was made for the Parker 51, oops, it says here, the Parker 51 and the Parker 21, both hooded pins, hooded nib pins. Um, it started out in these cool tins and you can hear that's metal. Very attractive. I think a great way to get people to take notice and buy it. It definitely looks different than any bottle or packaging that's out there. Uh, I'm assuming, I'm just guessing on a lot of this, that the metal was too expensive or too hard to make, so they switched to a cardboard. Still has a metal top on it, but it's like a cardboard sleeve, which I love. I think it's super cool as well. So uh, both of these, Parker Super Chrome, um, now these say they were only made for the Parker 51 pin. I think the 21 didn't exist at the time. Eventually, this is from 1948. Uh, eventually, it started saying for the 21 and the 51. Um, so, and you can see on the box, it has a hooded nib. Uh, could be a 51 or a 21 probably. But um, same as the Parker 51, very dangerous inks to use in a pin. They will eat your pin and uh, potentially do damage that's permanent and severe. So great to look at, great to collect. I would recommend against using it in a fountain pen if you come across it though. Um, towards the end of the 1940s, uh, Quink was still going strong. Uh, we had boxes that looked like these. Uh, eventually the packaging changed to something like this. So you can see here, there's a definite difference between these, but also a strong similarity. Um, just a little bit cleaner, design a little bit um, less words on on the sides. Don't let the color fool you. These were always blue pretty much. Um, they started putting the ink color um, as the box color in this and this is from 1948 as well. Now sometime around 1950 they changed the design to be a little more flat and that matches up really well with these as well. Uh, you can see 
they changed from more of a round design to a square design. So the boxes look very, very similar here, but if you look inside at the, at the um, bottles themselves, this bottle, exactly what you would expect out of here, out of here, it's still this classic shape that you would expect from a quink bottle. 1950 though, things started to change. So you could see this box was more rectangular. Get this out of here. The bottle became more rectangular as well. Um, still very plainly branded quink on the lid and the label, but um, starting a change of direction as far as box and bottle design goes. So now that we have this rectangular era from the 1950s, um, it kind of just moves from there. We have this um, quink with Solvex. Most of these had Solvex. Again, you can see it's rectangular, but a very different box design compared to this one here. And then here as well, um, quink became super quink, not to be confused with super chrome. This is a very different ink than this. Super Quink is completely safe to use in pins, but I think it was probably uh, Space Age or something. Yeah, it's 1960s and it just had to become super, not just ordinary Quink. So again, still rectangular, still pretty much um, you know, similar logo box design. It's just uh, changed, but things really changed when this box of Super Quink came out. Um, you can see here it is diamond shaped. It is a new font. It's new design. It's new everything. Super fantastic. This is probably one of my favorite bottles ever made. Um, the bottle itself is a cobalt blue, which is just gorgeous. Has this nice clean white lid and um, yeah, just a fantastic overall design. The box you can see again is diamond shaped, which makes for an interesting experience when opening it, but um, really not that much more complicated than a normal square box once you know what you're doing. So this was 1962, I think, uh, somewhere around there they started making these diamond shaped boxes and bottles with the cobalt glass. Um, and then after that things just kind of got a little more modern. I don't really have any examples up here of anything newer than that, but um, yeah, that's kind of a quick overview of Parker inks. I did want to also point out um, this bottle here uh, goes along with this box, or no, actually it goes along with this box. So um, you can see they still made these larger 16 ounce and 32 ounce bottles, um, even into the 1950s and probably I'm sure through the 60s. But um, the, again, the bottle shape Bottle design changed from here to here to this more, um, I don't know, it's, it's definitely more user friendly. It pours easier, um, it's easier to handle, and overall um, just kind of matches the, the aesthetic that we have here. So I hope you found that both interesting and helpful. That was just a brief overview of Parker Inks from the pretty much pre 1960 or so. Um, there is a lot more detail that I could go into if I really wanted to, but I don't want to bore you with all the minute uh, variations on box design or label design. So um, hopefully this gives you an idea of what's out there. The next time you see a bottle, you can say, oh, maybe you know that's from the 1950s, that's from the 1920s or 30s, um, or just hopefully enjoy looking at it. Uh, I personally love vintage inks, the design of the bottles, the smell of the ink. I use these inks, uh, assuming they don't have any mold or anything in them. They are just so much fun to use. I really enjoy loading up ink from the 1940s into my pen that's also from the 1940s. It's uh, kind of like a time machine where you get to experience something the same way that someone did 50, 60, 70 years ago. So anyway, I will leave it there. Uh, I will be doing this for other inks as well. I have Waterman script and probably some Carter's inks to cover. Uh, but for now, that is the Parker inks. Happy writing.